Hi everyone, welcome back into the classroom. We're going to con uh, continue on with some of our All of Prima studies. I just finished that elk. It's all over there getting ready to get varnished. Now I'm going to be, I'm going to show you some pears here. And you know, pears I've been painting for such a long time. And of course we do them in decorative painting, a little different than we do in more fine art type techniques. It's going to, you know, look at All of Prima. What is All of Prima? Like I've kind of explained to you before, it originally means do it all in one setting. So you try to do it all in one setting. But, you know, it it came about ba basically from Franz Halls, um, and who was a contemporary painter with Rembrandt. And he, you know, during those times, a lot of the oil painters created a, a technique called fat over lean, which means that you use more oil into your paints as you progress. You use more solvents in the beginning, and that allowed a better curing of the paints through themselves and thus the paintings won't crack. We had a problem with oil paints cracking. And so when I first was an oil painter, I did a lot of fat over lean techniques. And subsequently now, all the Prima techniques, if you're painting all the Prima and you're doing the entire painting in one setting, basically what you're doing is you're pushing the layers of the paint, of the oil and stuff together, and then you don't have to worry about fat over lean. But, uh, Acrylic artist. Now I'm an acrylic artist and have been for the last 30 years. And we can we can do it in a dry. We can do it in a wet form. Okay. I like to go back to the original meaning of do it all in one setting, though. But I'm going to do it wet on wet today here with uh, with you, so you can see how do you can approach it. And we're going to use that uh, that new medium that I've been you know showing you all about the Derivans, which I just it's just an amazing medium here, the Matisse uh, Derivan Matisse Open Medium. This is it here, and it has stayed wet for weeks out onto my palette. And it works really, really great. Uh, so I have my open medium here. I have a little cap of the uh, e extender medium here. Um, this is a, uh, it's a slow drying medium as well, but it's very, very thin as opposed to the, the open medium, which is thicker. And you can see it's really sticky and it is a great medium for, uh, for painting and especially an all prima type technique. Okay, so color-wise, I have out here my Hansa, my Darulite, my Yellow Oxide, uh, Naphthal Red Light, Burnt Sienna, Pine Green. I, since I'm not going to have too much blue into my pears here today, uh, I'm going to go to a softer blue that uh, tone shifts really easy. It's not as powerful as like a Thalo. And this is your Cerulean Blue. Um, this is my Quinacridone Violet, my uh, Red Violet, uh, White I put out two neutrals uh, today because basically some of this coloring into here, I thought I'd show you a Rembrandt technique and a Rembrandt glazing wiping off technique. And so I put out one of his favorite colors is the burnt umber. And this is medium beige, which is just a burnt umber, a little yellow and white. Okay. So we're ready to go. Got your value scales, got everything out to go. This is just, a, uh, you know, my regular size boards that I like to use. I think this is a 12 by 16 board here. You can use any size. I have my pairs here. Now, like everything else, go over to the JansenArtStudio.com. Click up at the very top, the free videos, go down, and then you'll see all the challenges and stuff, and you'll see the a la prima. And we're loading all of these videos up into that a la prima playlist. We will put the reference photos that I use there. We will put final photos for you to use there. You can go over to the supply page, click off and, pr and print off the value scales, color width charts, everything. If you go over to the, the mixes and stuff, you'll be able to see stuff like the brush mixing and how do you make warm, cool colors and all that kind of stuff. There's going to be a lot of information for you over there. So head over there and, uh, you know, take a look and print off some of that stuff. And then on your way back, make sure you click like and make sure that you subscribe to the channel. We appreciate it, okay? All right, let's get into this. Now, I'm just going to kind of freehand it. I like to take these, uh, you know, drafting uh, squares, and you can get them, you know, at any, like staples and stuff, And or I make my own out in Sydney, at our gallery in Sydney. You'll see me, I make my own right off of a... Uh, um, 
from a, a, a ruler that I get from either the Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that. But basically it allows you to put in your ground line about square and stuff. So I put my pairs up here so I can reference them. When I paint in an easel and I'm going to reference something like this, I like to put it in at about the height that I use that allows my eye to track right across and use that. Now, these are a little larger than what I'm probably going to paint. So, but the ground line, I'll try to keep it right there. So I'm just a, I'm just a little bit, maybe uh, just a little bit above halfway here. And I'll just draw a quick little line, reference line out there. That'll be my ground line, my back of my table line. And, you know, if you want, if you want to make like a plinth or something like that, you can create a line up here in the front or whatever. But I'm just going to do a, a quick painting. I'm going to do it, you know, all the prima here so that um, you can... Uh, get an idea for uh, you know for how to approach a painting like this we're going to study the technique you can change it modify it do whatever you want modify the designs i'm here to show you all different kinds of techniques tonal control teach you to see that's what i like to do okay all right so i'm going to do a original sketch out here now when i'm painting i don't have um any water out so I'm going to be painting mostly with my extender and my open medium so the colors stay the color stay absolutely wet so I want to uh, I want to preserve that and and do that but I'm just going to sketch here and basically I like this kind of setup and I don't want to put my you know that that one pair you know do we do one pair do we do three I don't like these two I like the different shapes of them but I don't like the the two of them just kind of standing up the same I like some of these up here you know they look a little different like you may take one that pulls here you may pull one out there kind of like that I'm going to take this one let's just kind of draw and basically what I do is I, when I draw Paris, I start out first with the little circle. And years and years ago, when I first started uh, painting, and we did it in decorative painting, we basically made a pair by putting two circles together. So, and this one will drop down maybe right about in here. So we put a smaller circle, and you put that circle together there, and you get the pear shape. And then what you can do is slowly round them together and make the, the tip of them smaller or larger or whatever you want to do. But basically, you can start your pear out that way. And I tend to, as again, I don't want to make these too, too big for us. And I tend to undersize them just a little bit when I do sketches like this. And, you know, if you're anything like me, our paintings tend to grow as we paint. You know, as you go, oh, I'm going to adjust this. And all of a sudden you've got a monster pear or a monster flower. So I tend to, when I do my original sketch, I tend to undersize it maybe just a little bit. So leave room to grow. That's what I like to do. Okay, so let's kick one out here. Let's uh, drop this one down back behind it. We'll put that little circle there. We'll drop this. We'll do more of that little pointed one here and drop a little pair right out there over there behind that one. So we'll turn this one out at an angle. And uh, let's just, and we're just playing here. This is, uh, you know, you can turn this into a, you know, a fantastic painting or you can just do what I'm doing. It's just practicing a little bit. Let's push one right out. Now let's not turn it at that angle, Dave, because then they'll look like they're two going out there like that. So let's push this one straight up a little bit more here. So I start like this and then I just start to round it off. And... Uh, Maybe we we'll, might even kick one further back, back here. If you're going to do that, do a little bit of linear perspective. Maybe draw it just slightly different, slightly smaller or something like that. This is just an idea. This one is not like we're painting, you know, a Rembrandt or something. We're just going to do an idea, okay? All right, let's go in. And I like, so I like to use small brushes like that. Now, you can use bristles. I'm using the Fusion. You can use bristle brushes. You know, this is all part of your particular technique. And the beautiful thing about painting pears and stuff like that, landscapes and everything, as opposed to painting the roses that you do so many times with me, is that you don't need to get that really refined edge. So you can go to a, you know, to a really a, a more bristle brush if you want to have a, a little bit more of a rough look to it. 
you can go to a, a synth I like a lot of synthetic brushes that have a little more spring to them I'm going to paint today with the Fusion, which is one of my favorites. But you can try all different kinds of brushes, and I, I really uh, suggest that you do that. Okay, so I've sketched this out. One of the things that Rembrandt would do immediately is he would put a glaze over this uh, of color, of his background color, and then he would wipe back out the areas that he was going to either paint the face or, you know, he did landscapes and other things as well. But he would do re what's called reverse type sketching. Um, and uh, that is really, really a fun way to do that. And because that really kind of changes everything that you're going to do. Now, our value of our background, we have to keep in mind here is a seven. So, so it's the background here that I made was white, a little black, a little yellow, my classic background that I use. If I put in the umbers and stuff and start taking this down, uh, you, you have to do it relatively quickly. Um, you know, you, there's all different kinds of ways. Let me, let me say this. There's all different kinds of ways to do this. What I'm showing you is just one. Uh, I've painted the Dutch techniques, modern, um, uh, you know, modern types of techniques where the background is painted after the first blocking in of color. So you go in and you block in color, then you push that background in. Uh, that is a great way as well. You know, there's a lot of really great ways. Your job is to learn them all and put them all up into here and find your technique. So if I was going to follow, though, some of uh, what Rembrandt says, and I think I'm going to do that with you today, I'm going to, I'm going to glaze, do my first initial glaze of the background, and then that, because that darker color through simultaneous contrast will make that light color that we put on look lighter. So I'm going to go ahead and do it right now. But you'll find many artists start the area of interest and then glaze the background and you can do that as well that is a fantastic way to paint and that's how I usually paint a lot of portraits and stuff like that as well so there's lots of different ways try them see which one you like this is what helps you develop your techniques I'm gonna take a little burnt umber okay and I'm just gonna thin it out with some extender when I do a glaze I like the color to be thin so I don't use the open medium. I'm going to use extender. And uh, the, the reason why is that uh, I don't want to give too much interest to my original glaze that I put down here. Now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back in like this. And I'm going to back paint around some of what my pears are going to be here, right into this. And sometimes I'll push the color, if I want a lot of tonal interest or so, sometimes I'll push the color right in and through some of those pears sometimes. So I get a, a bunch of different, uh, a different ways. But let's just push in some color here. And we'll just, we won't take the time to do the whole board and stuff right now. I'm just going to so we can see some of the color difference here. I'm going to push it in. But you can see it's kind of thin. This will stay wet for quite a while here. Now, if I'm specifically following, uh, you know, uh, you know Rembrandt, his types of techniques and stuff, he wasn't really an a la prima painter, but he had some wonderful glazing techniques that work really well if you're, if you're going to do, you know, a la prima and stuff. Uh, he would put it over the whole board, like I said, and then uh, come back and wipe through here. So, you know, you would put it in through here and then you and put it right in through your pears. You would lightly glaze back some of your pears back through here. You take a paper towel and you can see when you start to use your paper towel like this, do that, you can make one pear here completely recede back and the other one, you know, pop forward. So I can use a little color like this as you're doing that, just even into my paper towel here, and start to get some of the the, the first dimensions and stuff like that of the uh, the painting or how I might want to do or set up this painting here. With that extender, I'm getting just a little bit of a glare on that board here. It's coming from the snow outside. <laughs> I have the windows open and we got hit with so much snow we got over a foot of snow and it's all outside there and it's this nice and bright and really pretty and I should go shut the blinds but uh, 
it's really pretty <laughs> outside to look at that. So we'll look through that glare a little bit. Let's uh, just put some of this on. Now, I'm eventually going to want to soften some of this out a little bit more because that uh, is going to be too much movement and stuff in my background. But it's enough to kind of start out. And you can see right here, right now, that it's made these colors look lighter, hasn't it? See how it makes it really look quite a bit light. Now, if you are, I'm starting with the value seven, value seven gray. If I want my pears, let's say I want to paint this really glowy, bright yellow pear right up in the front, I've got to look to that, um, to those layers there. And I've got to think, how can I make that yellow look brighter without having to add too much white? Because if I add white, then that yellow starts to tone down. I tried to show you that with the yellow roses that we painted. The right way to do it is you're underpainting. So instead of starting with a value 7, start your painting up with, say, a value 10, white. The white will make that yellow. The white underneath that yellow will cause it to glow even more, okay? And then you can paint your uh, pears up on top of that. And the underpainting will will stop that, okay? So it's a really, a really a good way to do that. Okay, we shut down the windows because that glare was going to, that glare is going to bother us through the whole painting here. So we had to shut down the blinds. So... All that beautiful landscape out there is gone now, right now. All right, let's come back in here and I'll put on just a little bit more. Let some of that start to, it's not tacky at all, but put it on a little heavier right around. And you can direct a little bit, in, in, for right now, direct a little bit of your light source. So we're going to have it go dark back through here. And then we'll have it go lighter into the front. And you don't have to be per I'm not going to take a whole bunch of time to make it perfect right now. I'm just going to put on some of this color so I can start seeing my light direction of where I'm going to have light. Because we're artists of light. We have to always consider where's our light and stuff here. And eventually what I want to do is work with real small little movements of the brush. Um here as I put some of this stuff on. We'll talk about all of that. We're especially later on in the series we'll do a lot of that. Um, but uh, so you can see a little bit of the light direction here. Now if you want that to soften out and you're working in layers and you want to soften it out. Let's say that you don't you know you want to keep the brushwork um, not as expressive. Like on the elk I left that brushwork really expressive. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, keep that brushwork a little softer. That's what your medium beige does here. Medium beige with this will lighten it up, but medium beige is, of course, a mixture with the burn umber, but medium beige is uh, also more opaque. So if you can see here, as I add medium beige, especially through my mid-tone areas, medium beige is right between a four and five. It will help opaque up. So if you want to do this in steps, Instead of just going right directly to the dark, like, you know, some of the masters, the Dutch masters would be, you could take, like, medium beige and burnt umber and go through that first and make something a little less, let's say, a little less dark. And so, see, you can make it smoother here because your color is a little bit more opaquing. Now, you lose some of the glazing features of it, but you can see immediately you can smooth out here as opposed to here. And that's what any time, and so when you remember with all the premium, with just basic, basically everything, and, and I, I learned all of this years ago, of course, when we were doing fat over lean, and I learned how to work transparent layers of paint and opaque layers of paint. Anytime we wanted to opaque something, we had anything towards white because white is your opaque color. White is made from all the bands of light in, in, in natural light. And so addition of that causes more reflection back up through the layers and makes things more opaque. I learned that in physics in college. That's what we studied. 
this light. So if I want to really make it, you know, something up here softer and more pixie, I like lost little edges like that and to leave stuff like that. But I start to add a little bit of medium beige. So if I put some of this medium beige and if I start to work that into here, into this, you'll see immediately I start to opaque out my umber here and I make a softer, a softer transition, you know, of my colors. Do you do it? Do you don't do it? Well, that's up to you. That's that's part of your technique. My job is to show you what happens here and not say one is any better than the other. I do both here. But if I mix this up, just brush mix this up into here, you see I get a softer expression of color and those pears now just pop right off, right? And then I would go a little more medium beige, maybe medium beige, a little white, maybe a little bit of yellow, warmer color, if I wanted to impart. Now up here, where the light is, this is a piece of fabric where the light is, you know, you'd be trying to emulate a little bit of that. And so you know, that look, if that's what you want, I'm, I'm not so sure because this is, you know, by the time you get all of this in here and so much warmth in it, I may want to have some nice cools in here and maybe put in some blues or violets or, or not blues, but violet colors and soft greens and stuff like that to be a little more artistic. We'll look at that, you know, later on. But you can see that any time you add those light, those light, those white colors and stuff like that, you get more opaque. But now I start to... As for myself and building my, you know, what I want to do as far as my painting, I can quickly here work in the, uh, the light source, a little bit of the light source, okay? So, like I said, some artists will do this, well, a lot, let me just say this, a lot of uh, today's Ola Prima painters are what we classify ourselves as representational artists. In other words, we're using, uh, it's kind of like, between realism and impressionism, we're using impressionistic type techniques, and we don't we don't put out a, a photo representation of something, but you recognize immediately what it is. And uh, so it's representational art. It's a fantastic and fun way to paint, and there's lots of just amazing painters out there, artists out there, you know, doing these types of techniques. So. You know, how are you going to do it? Are you going to leave, you know, little bits of edges here or movement? Or are you going to make it more opaque and all that kind of stuff? There's thousands of ways to do it and thousands of looks. And I go through and I just, the creativity of the representational artists today is just really amazing. Okay. And a lot of times, like I say, they will start by blocking in, say, the pairs and then do the background. Rembrandt and stuff, because it's a fantastic thing I wanted to show you. And I did that with some roses and stuff too. But you can actually physically take some of this glaze color into your uh, pears and start to look or the toning of the look, you know, of the these pears. So I can physically take some of this umber, push it back here into this pear and start some of the depth immediately, start to see some of the depth in my... Uh, painting, you know, my movement of light, where I want to move light through the painting, and just by following a little bit of his technique, and, you know, maybe say, okay, here comes my shadow here, so I can say where my light is, and where my shadows are, and, and stuff like that. Rembrandt and, and some of the uh, old masters would, you know, just wipe out, put the color over and wipe out, and it's just a fantastic way. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And there'll be some artists that'll say this is the correct way to do it. I don't ever, I never, you know, as, as I teach you here, as I show you this, I just show you things. I don't like to say this is ever say that this is the correct way to do it. Because when you say that, you stop somebody's creativity. And I don't like to do that. Because we all like to do things a little different. And so, I mean, I'll tell you something, if it's not chemically correct, okay, you shouldn't do that because that's not a chemical thing, but I won't do anything to say, oh, don't, don't put this layer down first because that'll stop your creativity and I don't want to do that. Okay, so we're going to paint some pairs. So let's just start initially here with our block in. Let's look through our palette. 
The Hansa yellow is a semi-transparent uh, pigment. This is a semi-transparent pigment. This is an opaquing pigment. So it's a, it's a great pigment, especially further back into the line. We want to start with some glowy pairs. I'm going to make one. It, it's going to take a few layers of this color here to get some opacity to it, this, this nice glow up here, because it's a semi-transparent. But let's just block in first. We'll block in and put your sunglasses on. Okay, because this is gonna this is gonna be glowy. Some of you are gonna think I lost my mind, but that's okay. I'm an artist. We can do this kind of stuff. And so I'm just gonna work this in, and I'll work some. I work my brush. You know, in decorative painting, we would go wee like that. No, we don't want to do that. In Ala Prima block painting like this, you want to work small strokes. And what you're actually doing is you're emulating those strokes where the movement of light would be. So I'll hit some of that shadow, I'll drop some of that in there like that. Gives you a way to do it. Why do I make it so glowy? It's not going to end up that way at all. But see those initial glowy tones underneath there? That's where we're going to go. So we've got to start that pair that way. Now, you could also start Hansa Yellow here and then Yellow Oxide and stuff down into the shadows. That's another way. In other words, do like I do and some of the others were, you know, and like I showed you, like, say, for example, on the Retrievers. If you haven't watched that one, go watch that one. That's where I go in and specifically make the tones in each area, okay? That's a great way to do it, okay? But it, I'm not making a Retriever that glows. Does that make sense? So... You know, here uh, I'm thinking about this also. Uh, I want some of these undertones maybe to show through. We're in acrylic. In a pure oil situation, all prima and oil situation, you would want some of those layers to, to blend down in because you're direct painting. There is what we call direct and indirect painting. We are direct painting here. We're not letting anything dry. Okay, so we're doing it directly, and we'll talk more about that and everything. There's a lot to these techniques, but they're fun if we, you know, you'll have to watch this video a few times, but they're fun. They're fun techniques, and there are a lot of them, okay? There are a lot of them. But let's just think. Let's just think here through our light passage. So you see this one way back here. So if I want to start to impart, so, you know, how my pairs might look, I can copy directly from here, which I don't always like to do. I can copy those tones, and then I end up painting a picture, trying to make a photo look at like picture. Or I follow this as just an example for some of these tones, and I paint a painting. And so if I want this pair to come forward, this pair to recede, I'm going to go down my scale here to my yellow oxide. And maybe yellow oxide with a bit of my burnt umber so it starts to go a little bit more towards the background. I used to always tell my color students, whatever you show here, go two values up. So if you're showing like a three, you would base in with a five. And that always worked. Always worked. But if I take that yellow oxide, which is a four, add a little bit of the burnt uh, umber to it just to tone it down. See, I get this softer uh this softer yellow. Maybe I can come up a little bit brighter here. But we don't want this one in the back to glow so much. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to do, if you're doing pure all the prima, you're going to do small marks. I would say no more than like a three quarters of an inch. Small marks this way as you as you work color in. Maybe a little bit more burnt sienna on the, the back side so you get a bit of toning here. Okay, on the bottom side here we will put in all the pretty reds and all that stuff what we're doing right now it's just as we're blocking in we're just giving ourselves the ability to see some of where our lights and tone colors are so now you see you can have a pair from here to here and that's a lot of difference but look at how look at the shadow tone here how it drops down it actually becomes quite a bit greenish in there so it does drop down quite a bit if you want to see a little bit more uh, brightness to it, you can add a little Hansa or a little bit of Darulite and put that where your light would be. If you're saying my light's going to come up here, it's going to hit up into this quadrant right up in here, 
then I will put it right up in here into this quadrant. But it will be no lighter or brighter than what I'm showing in the front. Does that make sense? So I can lighten it up or brighten it up a little bit here. But I don't want to do it too much yet here. We'll just put some of that color in. Now, I'm not adding any of the open medium right now. If you were going to do this absolutely pure Ala Prima, well, what they would consider Ala Prima now, wet and wet and wet edge, you would be adding open medium. But I'm showing you this color movement and sometimes balancing it out. This is the one advantage that I like with acrylics is I can put it in here and let this kind of dry up, tack up here. So you can see as it's tacking up and drying up here, I'll be able to paint up on top of this now and get a really nice effect and use this kind of like my map to see where I'm going, okay? Now all i got to do is come in between. So I'll just take maybe my Hansa and my yellow oxide, a little bit of, uh, of the uh, um, burnt umber there, about one to one, and I'll just start to block in. Doesn't that be perfect? But just instead of going wee down the side here like this, you do it in small marks that are small brush marks that so you break this C stroke up into maybe three or four strokes. How many do you do? That becomes part of your statement as an artist. You know, I used to back into the uh, and I've mentioned her before back into the uh, 90s and uh, late 80s and 90s. I used to always watch Helen Van Wick and how she always presented a la prima and you know with oils and just absolutely loved her paintings and uh she always said you know never take too long of a brush stroke that was her big thing and i always watched how long of a brush stroke she took in her uh, in her paintings now i'm going to put a little more hansa and hit where i think the light would be and I'm painting pure acrylic right now, so I'm going to let this dry up. But it, it's allowing me to see where my lights are going to be into my pairs. And I can see I could have that one just a little bit more light. Maybe right up in here. Right there. And that works pretty well. Now this one, I could put it on the same plane as this one. Or, you know, kind of how I have this drawn, actually. Here, I should take maybe a little yellow and a little burn umber here and just put the shadow of this one right up in front of that one here. And uh, we'll put a little tone here. I'm not being specific with my tones, not as much as I'm going to be pretty quickly here. Um, but we'll work there just so this one, the roundness of this one comes up in front of that one. You can do that by lightening up the front pair or adding just visually right now. You don't have, you're 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 doing things here so you can help see your your painting. So I'll put a little shadow right here right now to help separate those so I can visually see it. And you can do that on the other one. Doesn't have to be perfect. This is this is all part of the process. You know, just like I, I teach you when we're painting roses and stuff, you know, part of the whole process is trying to see the painting, see where you're going, making yourself a, a map with those three circles so you start to see the rose and you start to paint the rose. So you can, as you're blocking in and doing this kind of stuff here, you can kind of see where you're going to go, okay? Now, again, this is just one of many ways of doing it, okay? And I'm going to show you some other ways. So if I decide here visually, if I am, uh, I decide that uh, I'm going to push this pair, where's this pair going to go? Well, then if you want to be absolutely precise about it, you got to look to what we call linear perspective. So here's the ground line. So here's the pair where that one is. And then here's this one right here. And so you look at where this pair is on the ground line, if you put it right here, and this one should actually, if I want to keep my linear perspective a little bit better, this one should push back just a bit here. And that's better. See, when I start adding my perspective to it, it gets a little bit better. So here's the ground. So if you look at linear perspective, it's lines going back to your horizon line or here to the table line. So here, 
then the next pair is here. See where it touches right there. The next pair is higher yet. Now, so this pair, to make it really pretty, this pair we can put right between this one and this one, and uh, this third and this this one here and the this one here. So here's this one. So if I paint that pair down to here, if I start it in right in here, it's at the same level as that one. If I paint it here, it's at the back level there. If I go basically right in between, kind of right where I have it drawn right in there, its table line is higher up than this one, and so it'll be right between those two. And that's kind of a good place, which means yellow oxide, maybe just a bit of the burnt sienna, I mean the, uh, the um, yellow oxide and just a bit of the burnt umber here. We'll place this in. Okay, and then it will be a little bit more toned than this one and a little bit brighter than what that one's going to be as we as we work those colors. But then we'll also got to th think about the light so it might come up a little bit brighter. But, and we'll work that all out. Sometimes you don't know unless you do a sketch and you have it all mapped out. I'm going to put just a little bit brighter. My light on this one would hit right about in here. So I'm going to push in some light here, okay? And then we'll go back to our yellow oxide. A little bit of the burnt umber. You could even add beautiful, you know, if you really want to uh, kill its intensity, add some of that medium beige. And that works really pretty for a softening of the pear going into the back. So we could add some medium beige back into that. And see, it makes a pretty softer color going back, you know, on some of those edges and stuff like that as a nice tone. It's a beautiful painting tone, especially if you have umber anywhere into your painting. The medium beige works really, really well. Okay, so now we see our nice glowy pair. We've got it kind of a little bit blocked in. Doesn't have to be perfect at all. We're not putting in perfect edges. We're putting in some lost edges here. We can work our edges. Lost edges mean we don't want to have any textures or anything like that. We can work our edges over and over and over again and we can soften it out. Does that make sense? Okay, now you can come in like if you're, um, you know, doing Premier Coup or something like that, you can, which is also a, you know, direct painting type of technique, like all the Prima and stuff, you can come in, start some of your lights, and work some half tones. That's another way. I'm going to go from shadows and then work some half tones, and then lights, and then we'll start adding accessory tones. What I do is I sit down and I just don't paint. I start to formulate a plan of what I'm going to do with my paintings here, especially if I'm emulating light. I just don't sit down and start looking at something and painting what I see because I want to add consistency to my painting and I want to make a painting, not a representation, a photorealistic photo of what it is that I'm, I'm painting there. So I'm making a painting. Um, I used to do a lot of photorealism. I don't care for it anymore. I like to make beautiful paintings. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is add some shadows. So I'm going to start in and add some shadows. Then I'm going to come in and add some half tones, maybe some half tones with half tones are halfway between the light. So here's the light. Here's the shadow. This would right in here would be considered a half tone. So it would be a half tone. So here's a light. Here's a shadow. Here's a half tone. Okay. So whenever you're making a half tone, it's whatever you identify as a shadow, whatever you identify as a light, and it's halfway between. And in those half tones, especially on this little pair, is where I'm seeing the reds, some greens, and some alternate hues, which we'll, we'll go ahead and apply. But let's just start here with some shadows. And on this pair here, I'm going to I'm going to key off a of burnt umber because that's going to cause a uh recess uh, to recede the tone. I'm going to get rid of some of this right in here right now. And uh we'll just take this up. Now, as I paint this, I'm going to go to Pure All Prima and I'm going to start adding since I have it all blocked in, I'm going to start adding my uh my medium to this as well. So I'm going to feed it. And it's really easy to forget to feed it. So you even mix up some right in here really well first. I'm going to take some burnt umber and some yellow oxide. I'm going to make myself a nice 
a nice cool shadow tone. So I'll drop yellow oxide down a little closer to my burnt umber right down in here that you see down into this area here. So I'll get a receding and then I'm going to cool it because my shadows need to be cool. And so I'm going to cool it. Now with a pear, you can cool it with the um, any kind of red violet which works really well or any kind of uh, kind of greenish color blue greenish kind of color but I'm gonna drop this in as a nice cool right down in here and so I'm gonna so I'm basically gonna take it I'm gonna divide this circle up into many different types of strokes here but basically along the bottom is gonna go that cool color here and I like this. I like movement. You know this from the roses. Many times as I paint stuff like this, I use my brush like this. So what happens is I get this fracturing of the tone this way, which is what you see happening in through there. See? So I do like to, to do that. Do you do that or not? What do you want to do? Does that make sense? What do you want to do? Do you want to blend it absolutely smooth? Then lighten up your pressure, thin out your color a little bit, and work the color back and forth a little bit. So and what I mean is, all I have to do is put a little extender into this brush, pinch wipe it like this, lift, go back on my long handle brush like this, and go over that, just like that, and I will start to soften out and blend out that effect. Now, I don't like that that makes it too smooth and I see more modeling and stuff of my colors in my in the pairs in there than then that gives me so I like I like this kind of stuff and uh, I like that kind of interest and stuff should you touch it with your fingers <laughs> you know you know in the last roses I've been telling you well don't I'm not going to touch it we're going to paint all the primer and try not to touch it I love to touch all the primer. I really do like to push my fingers into the wet paint and stuff, but I'll try not to. We'll try to do it with our brush here. All right, so that sets that one in. Let's put a little bit of that cool color, maybe a little more red violet and a little more burnt umber this time. Not as much yellow, just a touch of that yellow, but uh, a little more red violet, a little more burnt umber because I'm going back into the painting. So that will cool it down a bit more. And I'll look up through here. That shadow rises up here pretty much before the the high apex of the pear, which is going to be halfway here. So once light, once you hit the round part of the pear, this is the round part of the pear here. Once you hit that apex, the forward part coming out here, you're in shadow. So you know you would want to you want to push that in there now i'm going to push a little bit of that tone right into here just to marry those two together just a bit i like to do that and then right in between here for right now now see there's not a lot of softening in there but there can be so you could make yourself a half tone go between identify this tone here which is our yellow oxide Try to remember a little bit about what you do. It doesn't have to be perfect, though, guys. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yellow oxide, a little bit of my Hansa. Then we'll add a little bit of this. Create a tone that's just about halfway. And I love the push-pull and the setting down like this of these tones. And I'll, sh and I'll soften that. Now, that softened pretty well against the light. Not so well against the dark. So I just pinch wipe my brush with your handy-dandy towel push my color here a little bit more towards that dark and I'll push that in and push some of that half tone in just like that and now I've softened it while preserving some of that movement that I want to put into this pair okay so I like to hold the brush flat when I get a lot of movement if I hold it back like this and go way back I get a the tip of the brush stays very soft and when I make the stroke it blends see the difference when I make the stroke there, see how it blends? And that makes it that makes it smooth. So if you hold your brush back like this and you hold it flat and you let that fusion brush drag like this, you will get a lot more brush, brush movement, interest. If you go back on your brush, pinch wipe your brush, go back, use the soft hair and pull this way, it'll blend. Does that make sense? So if I... If I see something here and I go, you know what, I, I don't like that, I want to blend a little bit, then just 
take a little extender into your brush, take just a bit of that dark out, put a bit of that medium, just a little bit of it in your brush, wipe it just real quick, step way back on your handle, real light with the, with the, with the pressure of your brush like this, and just drag it over there just a couple of times. Let the hair, let the top hair of the brush do its job, and you'll soften that out. And the more yellow that I put into my brush, the softer that shadow becomes this way. And you can see you can blend that out that way. How much you're going to do, how much you want to do, that's up to you. And so, you know, in a lot of the movement, just like it is with roses and everything else, a lot of the movement is controlled by how you hold your brush. And that's one reason why I do a lot of seascapes, I do a lot of landscapes, as they're putting in different types of planes of light. They tend, there's a lot of different, you know, from your painting knife, using your palette knife or painting knife to your brush, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And that's one of the things that I like to look at. Let's go a little darker now. Let's just go some red violet and some burnt umber here. Quite a bit more burnt umber because that's really the color that is going to go back here. And you can see that now, that really goes back, maybe a little too much, but... That really goes back. Let's marry that together just a bit of that tone. And I will sometimes marry that tone. Look for where some deep ridges are right up in here, up into this one, and push that tone right up into that area is there as well. Now, I like that type of look, but you can pinch wipe your brush, take a little soft and run just a bit. See, just pinch wipe your brush run hold the brush down here and just run that over it just a bit like that and push that tone a little further in together there if i want it smoother i pinch wipe my brush i put that color into the tip step back on your brush very light pressure and just pull and that becomes smoother and i don't like that quite as much because it doesn't have that modeled interest so i like to push it through just a bit and leave some of that modeling but you can see that now how do you soften that there? Bunch of different ways, right? But uh, you do it with a half tone. So I'm going to come in here, take a little yellow, a little bit of that color and that red, and this one right here, and we're going to push right here. We're going to push this tone right in together there like that. Now you can do a push-pull like I do there. I like that push-pull. Or you can do the just pick up paint and do the pure all prime, which a lot of artists do, of just the strokes. And usually when I do strokes like this, I, I always tell everybody, don't stroke more than like three times with that tone before changing it slightly on your palette, or else you'll end up with the same color everywhere. So I like to do no more than like three strokes. So there you can see I set that back. Now I'm going to put just a bit more of that right out in there onto that pair. So now you can see the shadows and stuff going here. As you're going back, this one, the shadow, and we're not really going to study a whole bunch of light here with this painting, give you too much and you'll be changing the channel, <laughs> give you too much information, your brain's going to explode here. Um, but uh, basically what happens is the, more, the shadow expresses larger on the objects that are in the back, so a little more shadow than what is actually in there. And you can see that here. So look at the area of light here to the area of light here. But look at the area of shadow to the area of shadow. So as objects go back, their expressed shadows get larger. The amount of shadow that's on them gets larger. Of course, there's a lot of things that vary that, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways. But anyway, we'll come in and we'll soften. Try to push it into different shapes of your brushes. So don't don't just go like that. Don't just round it like that. You'll make a bullseye, okay? You want to make small strokes. And in all of Prima, you would actually break those planes, you know, break those into planes. Now, if I'm going to bring my light in here, that means I have a small bit of, sh of shadow over on that side of the pair over there. I know it's going to be there. And don't forget to feed your medium. Let's just take a little bit of that shadow and push that over onto that side for right now. And then we'll take a burnt umber, a little bit of the 
maybe even a little medium beige into this. And if I feel my paint's too sticky, I'll grab some of the uh, um, nice extender. If I feel that, um, you know, I want to work it a little longer, I'll grab that open medium because you'll be able to work that forever with that open medium. Let's put that on. Let's go back to some yellow oxide and just work that through here. And how you how you break up your strokes is all going to be part of your technique that you use. Does that make sense? Here. So there we go. We'll just break some of that up and set some of that one in. Let's go back. Let's lighten up the front. Let's go work on our primary one up here. Let's take some yellow oxide and let's go with some Darulite. We're going to start looking for some, some interest, some color tone interest here. So let's push some of that in. Don't forget to add that medium. I forgot to add that in there and I felt it immediately on the board. You'll feel a little bit of a drag and a slide with the open medium, which is a beautiful medium. Here, let's push some of that in there. That's going to work great. And then I'll slide right in here to a half tone that's right between this one I push here. Let's just slide some of that in here. And I can look at doing different strokes and stuff like that. The thing is that one of the things that makes beautiful pairs or just, just in general beautiful painting is the tones, the number of tones that you make. The more tones you make during your painting process here, the prettier the object starts to become. Do you see all of the little coloring and stuff that starts to happen in there? That becomes very pretty. And you'll start to, uh, you know, bring these things together. Now, I've got some nice colors here, but I don't want to work too long here before I maybe change up. Let's, let's go over here to some yellow oxide and a little bit of that quinacridone. That is a beautiful tone, and maybe even sometimes a little bit of the green which happens into this pair. Look at how that grays down. That's a beautiful half tone right in through here. That's just a little bit different, see? It's just a little bit different tone. Maybe we'll we'll uh, get a new paper towel here. Maybe we'll come in and uh, we'll look into here and say, okay, that could be a little bit warmer. So I like that tones right in there. That kind of is a good idea. I can see a little bit more maybe orangey type tone there. So let's grab some of our Darulide. Just a little bit of that naphthol red light here. Let's make a warm tone and to the orange. Add some medium to it. Don't forget to add your medium to it here. Okay. Now if you want it to gray, that's your green. Add a little bit of green. Now see how the green grays that down. You see that green just does a nice job of graying all of that down. That's a little too much, but it does a nice job of it here. That's a beautiful tone. All these are beautiful tones here onto the pair. And let's just think about little. Let's use that little and maybe a little bit more oranges right into there. That's a pretty tone. See, it's different than that one and softer and warmer than that other tone we put on there. That's where the beauty really starts to come. And this is one, it's like painting pairs. When I first painted pairs of decorative painting, base coat shadow, highlight, and you never, you know, sometimes we put a little reflected light or something like that on it. Uh, as I went in to study animal portraits, like that, that those retriever that's on this channel here, I mean, you really want to see how to, to get finite with tones, head over to that retriever. Watch that playlist that's over there with that one. And you'll see, just taking those yellows, how to vary some of the different yellows. That's going to make beautiful pairs. Being able to, you know, change that tone and just making a quick, what we call mark. Make a quick mark of it. Let's take a little bit of this Hansa right into that. And let's just change that tone right in there. See, that's a beautiful tone right there. Maybe hold the brush flat, fracture it off a bit here like that, see? So you get some of that nice, that nice movement there. So you start to emulate that area of the pear. You don't emulate that area of the pear there with your brush out onto the tip because that's going to blend it. You want to hold the brush flat and slide it like that, okay? Let's take... 
let's add the tiniest bit of white now to this, which is going to opaque the color a bit. But we're going to, we're, I'm going to establish a bit of my light. So I see a bit more of the light direction here onto this pair. And you can do this at any time here. It's going to opaque it a bit, but we're going to put a bit of light there and a bit of light there. Okay. Now, I don't want to paint too long with that because that's opaque and that'll take out all of my movement. So I'm going to pinch wipe my brush. Okay. And feed your brush. Let's go back here to a softer half tone. Maybe the two of them together with a little bit of this orange right in here. And let's just work that right along that edge here. Don't paint too long before you change it. Maybe a bit of green over here because I'll hit this back receding edge here with that green. With a little bit of green into it. And look at that. So I'm coming around my highlight here with some other tones and letting that, see as I, I let that modeling go there like that, see it starts to put in all of that little interest that you're going to want to have inside of that of that pair. Do not, and of course this has everything and, and you know, I'm not here to like sell you acrylics or do anything like this, but this has everything to do with the quality of your acrylics. If you're using an acrylic that has a lot of what we a chemical, what we call destrin, which is an opacifier to a color, makes the colors opaque. Uh, lower cost grades of acrylics have a lot of that in there to help them opaque. They will not be able to get that kind of look. You need those semi-transparent pigments to get these types of looks. Yellow oxide won't give it to you. That's why I'm painting with the Darulite and the uh, um, the Hansa because it they have the semi-transparents. Let's just put let's push a bit of that orangey green right here. And let's just make a quick little mark. That's kind of a pretty color there. It's hitting closer to that, but that one's a little more orange. Do you see that? So we'll grab a little bit more orange. Let's just make that mark there. That's a little closer in tone to that one. Let's make a bit more yellow right up here onto the top. Just drag that right there. Now let's go back to our darker tone. Maybe a little green into that to change it just a bit. And let's push that right along the bottom there, like that. And I so much want to just touch that lightly with my finger. But you can assist any, lightly come back like this and assist any softening or movement of your tone just by lightening the pressure on your brush. Let's go back. I, I do like some of the greens in there. As I get to those receding tones, what that does, the green does, is it toned down and grays your cooler colors that you have here, your violets. So you can see it grays it down, see? So it, it grays, this is the color that you're seeing there, grays it down, which is right about what you're seeing happening right in there, right? So I can just, I'm going to lightly, almost like a blend here, just lightly soften that through like that. And, just softening some of that motion there and you can see you start to pick up some of the the coloring that's there so maybe I want to take a bit of that gray and just run some of that tone not completely but some of that tone into there let's go back up this kind of a greenish mid half tone right in there we'll take some of that we'll just model it right in here make sure you add some of this these colors. I'm just going to bring these together a bit. Let's just move that tone right into there. Boy, that's pretty darn close of what that tone is on that one there, see? And then we'll go back up towards our yellows a little brighter and just run the edge. Okay, maybe a bit more of the violets right here. Run just a bit of that. So I can I can pick up some violets and touch it into there and get some of that difference. Now, if you want to smooth anything out, you know, if you want to smooth that movement out, it's not really all that necessary because we still have a lot of tones to put on, but you can pinch wipe your brush like this and just pull over the top of it just lightly, and that'll do that, okay? But you don't have to do that too often because as we apply more tones, it's slowly going to... Uh, to get softer and softer. Let's go a little deeper, a little burnt umber and green, and some of our violet. 
Let's go a little deeper right down in there. And uh, that may be too dark, but it does pick up that tone that's there. Now to soften that, I don't want to blend that in there. I'll kill because that's a powerful color. So I want to soften it in my brush back up to, towards my half tones and just soften that lightly into the brush there. Pull that across. So this is how I paint a lot of them. As I go back up here towards the warmer side, so let's just set up, let's use some good palette stuff here. We'll get our lighter colors, our more toned mid colors here. So up here in our pairs will be our lighter colors here. The Hanses, the Darulides, and the Whites, okay? You've got to be really careful with white. You don't want to drag it all over this pair or you will lose the glow of that pair. Does that make sense? And look at how this is starting to look like that, that glow. We could use a little more Hansa working around the top part of the pair here. Now, I'm going to just deposit some paint. Sometimes with my in my opaque areas, I like paint. I like to pull some paint down into those areas there. So I like that paint. Now, I've got to soften that, okay? And I'm looking at this, and can you kind of see, kind of squint, kind of see like a plane that you can take right like that? So if I put that kind of greenish, maybe a little bit of my shadow tone, kind of those together like that, set this brush down in here and work kind of that plane just a bit, I will start that plane. Now, as I rise up on my brush, that's going to make the stroke softer. Does that make sense? Because I'm using more of the tip instead of down there by the ferrule. Down there by the ferrule, right down the ferrule is where the brush is the stiffest. Up here is where the brush is the softest. So you rotate the brush. You, this is why we create these fusions. I rotate the brush down here to grab interest, up like this to do a softening of the stroke that way. See? And I'm starting to emulate. I could pull down a little bit more of that light here. If anything, this is getting a little tight right here. So I'm just going to add some extender to it to loosen it up a bit. But I'm actually up here now. I'm traveling my palette <laughs> quite a bit. Okay, so that's a little better right in there. But I'll just do a couple of light strokes there after I put that on. Now that gives it a good plane, and I'm starting to emulate the look of that there. I'm going to rise way back on my brush, way back on the handle here like this. And I'm going to pull down at a couple of angles. Sometimes, you know, I'll do it a few times, but you don't paint for too long. Now look at that beautiful movement you have in that pair, and you're starting to emulate that that other pair there. Here's a nice soft. We can really soften it out, get that half tone, get that yellow oxide in there, which is more opaque, which will really help you soften that out real quick. Boom. And I'm going to reset that light into that as well. Just boom. And I'm going to go back to that yellow oxide. I'd love to paint this way. We call this the back and forth of the colors, the edges. And this is one of my favorite ways to paint as I go back and forth. Now I'll start to work that edge. Now sometimes I leave that edge really blurry, which helps you in recede stuff, and sometimes I bring it up a little bit more. You know, there's all kinds of ways, all kinds of fun ways. There's a little bit of that kind of modeling color in there. So you can see I tap and roll the brush to get some more movement in there. Let's take a bit of our quinacridone and a bit of our red right into some of that dark. Let's put it into the brush like that. Hold this down like this and push and pull that right in there like that. We want to create that modeling of color area into that pair there. And I'm going to pinch wipe my brush. I'm going to come back up here with a bit of orange because I see the orange in there too. So a bit of the orange here, softer, just a little bit into the brush. And I'm just going to hit the edges of that, tap the brush. See, I just took one stroke. Put a little yellow, change the color a bit, tap the brush. And work this color, change the color, change the tone slightly. Hit it there. 
maybe I can uh, soften that just a little bit more. I'm going to step way back on my brush, just pull through just a bit. If I want to really soften it, I step back and pull through. Now you see the modeling that you're creating here. Now I get rid of that line there. You see a little yellow? See a little light? Let's put a little bit of that light in there and just take a quick little mark and we soften the edge of that and now just quick little touches you get this beautiful modeling here of those colors and you start to emulate what's happening in there. Does that make sense? It is really fun. Now here's the other thing. I'm slowing this down and showing you a lot of brush techniques. A lot of times when artists are painting the a la prima direct they'll just they'll squint we squint down and we would blend this area right here to a tone basically and strike the tone you try to work very fast but you can see here with the acrylics even doing it this way I can get a, a really nice a really nice look and I can build my light back up here again but I can build a really nice look to uh, your painting here by uh, just looking at the tones and how I hold my brush and everything. And I started, when I started to paint like this years ago, I started to also do this on roses too and other things. So I'll put some light and then I'm heading to the shadow. So I'm going to get that shadow, change the tone a little bit. Let's put a little bit of that red right in there because I see just a bit of that. I'm going to step back and do a softening stroke because that's a receding edge. I want it a little softer than what I see going on in there. That's a personal artistic choice. That doesn't, it's not one way correct or not. And let's put a little bit of that orange up there in the front. It's a bit much, so I'll go switch over to my yellows here. Let's just touch a little yellow onto the edges of it. Sometimes I'll push it there and take a bit of that out. Now, I want to soften right there, so I'm going to go back to my half tones. Maybe a little bit of green into that here. Just soften that edge. And right back down in here, some of the yellows on my brush and pull through. So if I, if I want to really soften, I lighten the pressure, step back here and just do a softening mark that way. If I want to get more interest, then I don't. So how much you're going to leave in there is all going to be up to you. Now in the front pair, you can do more defining of the edges here too. Um, you can build out those edges a little bit more, okay? That's all up to you. Um, I'm going to express a bit more light back up in here onto the pair. So I'm going to hit my light here again, here, push in some more paint. Sometimes when you're painting like this, you have to do this two, three, four times. But you see a larger area of about a value seven or so yellow right in there. And I might even hit a little yellow oxide in here. Just a bit more into that. But this is where I like to build paint, build paint, build paint here. Model it down here. And put some of that shadow tone in there. If it starts to drag too much on your palette, thin it out with some extender. Does that make sense? I've got a little bit of a kind of a reddish mixed up into that green. I just do that real quick and start to grab that. Boom. Right in there. Okay. And then I can soften back here. And you can, uh, let's use a bit of the yellow oxide, some of my reds here. And we'll do more of a drawing for the back edge of that pair there. So we'll push that in. So if I really want to bring it forward, I got to consider my lost and found edges, right? And bring that forward. So now you can see that pair. And it could be built again. And generally when I'm going to be building again, before I make that set, well, you can clearly see it needs to have more. But I will go work some of the other pairs. So I... I don't take any, this is what I like to do, so I don't take it too far out of perspective, okay? So that's a very important point, okay? It's what we call visual perspective. And visual perspective can cause you frustration, 
Okay, now what do I mean by that? Visual perspective is when, you know, well, let me just put it this way. Whenever I would, when I teach classes and I tell everybody, okay, we're going to block in colors. No one ever gets really frustrated at blocking in colors because there's not a lot of contrast going on and we're keeping the whole painting in perspective. As we start to paint light and dark onto something, frustration starts to happen because this object starts to look so different than everything else in the painting. Does that make sense? Okay. And so when you start to, if you work on something too long, what happens is you lose visual perspective for it. You can't see it anymore. It just looks wrong. And it may not be wrong, but it looks so much different than the other elements in your painting that you can't relate it to those. So you cannot understand what's wrong with it or what might be wrong with it. So you keep trying and putting it and you start to focus down and working on one thing. And the best thing that the artist can do is work through the painting and start to bring the light source back in to keep the painting in perspective so you can see the light moving through. Then you'll see where the trouble areas are on that pair. As I start to come here, for example, here, let me just take this pair right out of visual perspective. Really easy. Boom. Now we're out of visual perspective. And the light color I just put on there caused every other color on this painting to compress down and completely look wrong, look dead. And they're not dead. Okay, because I've, took in, I've taken trying to work on this pair, work on this pair, work on this pair. I've made it too light. Does that make sense? Okay, so I've taken it out of visual perspective. And that pair is not that light here. So I've really kind of screwed it up. But don't worry, I am a professional. <laughs> All you have to do is take it back down. But that's called visual perspective, guys. And a lot of you that you write to me about frustration and everything like that, the majority of the time, frustration is caused when you take your painting out of perspective, okay? Visual perspective. So I always tell my students, if there's a rose, if there's, you know, something bothering you, you can't get this eye correct on this dog or something like that, go work someplace else, bring the perspective back in, and then you'll start to see where that problem is. But when there's so much light and out of perspective here, you can't see what is correct here. That light color right here actually compresses this down to these two look almost the same. Does that make sense? So the whole thing is out of perspective because that is too light here. So go back, work some of the pers perspective. I can start making that look more correct if I and I don't, you know, but if I start to lighten up this one, that one starts to look a little bit more correct following it in line. But this one is not completely correct, but it starts to help. It's called visual perspective, and it is a bugger. If you, if you take something out of perspective here, it's hard sometimes to uh, get that, you know, to get it back. So here, I'll take that back. I'll leave some of that light. That's going to be still just a touch lighter, but it's going to be close, closer to what the maximum is on that one there. And we'll work some of that out. Go back here to some of my half tones. This is getting a little sticky here. This is where I start to add the extender in there. Here, work that out. Let's work that half tone right in here. Push pull, I like that. Tap it sometimes. Sometimes I'll do a softening stroke here. We'll push some more of this color in. You can really see that, boy, that yellow oxide and maybe a, a, some of all three of my yellows right up here. That'll make a perfect like color right in there that that pair really has to go to in that particular area. You can see that color. I'll work a little bit of that texture out of there. Let's just work a bit of that. So I like to do multiple strokes, different angles. That's brush calligraphy here. I'll work that. But uh, I'm going to move on here to uh, some of the other uh, colors you see here in the rest of the pair. Let's just take some of that. One right here. Let's push that through into here. Okay. Let's cause a receding edge. After you get going, you're going to really be able to, to get going 
here. Greens, red violets, burnt sienna. I mean, excuse me, burnt um, burnt sienna is another beautiful color um, that you could use. You know, here the burnt sienna. Boy, have that out here, especially in the ones towards the back back here. Start incorporating that. Look at that beautiful receding tone right there for that mid-ground area on that pair. That is a beautiful tone. You can, and you look at that compared to that, this one's a little more greenish right there than that, but that's a beautiful tone. And sometimes when I'm painting and I make these tones, I like them better than what I see in the photo. And you, you don't copy the photo. You leave that pair. You leave that pair where you see it here. Let's, uh, push back just a bit of that light right in there on that one. Sometimes you build up, build up, build up paint and it gets, you know, when you put a light color on it kind of disappears. Has that ever happened to you? Happens to me a lot. But uh, that's just the paint eating it up, all the paint that's there. And that's the beautiful thing about acrylics. I can just let that tack up for, you know, 10 minutes or so here, and then I can lay the next colors on a lot easier. When I used to paint in oils, it just get, got me so frustrated here. And uh, so we'll just lay in a little bit of the light here, like that. Here, a little bit of that light, and you can see, that's what I wanted to show you guys here. You can see how you go about painting that pair, and, you know, are you going to leave it really mottled, or are you going to Take this nice softening stroke right up here. How much of that yellow are you going to leave showing there? You know, I love that type of movement into the pair. That's what you see in there, see? And you do it by the, the different types of stroke that you use. Don't always use the softening stroke. And so it is really, really important for your brush. You know, the brush that you use with this, and of course, the quality of the color, but the brush that you use. Now, you don't see any reflected light in there, and that's something that I do like to add to my paintings. So I did years of light study and stuff. I do like to add those, but I don't necessarily do it right away here. But let's bring this other one back here into the light. So we'll grab some of this light here. We'll push this one back into place here. See that little edge there of that light. And so a lot of times I don't worry too much about the shape of my pairs. I start to get the, the tones in where I like it and the modeling in where I like it. So you see how I push it down flat and then a softening stroke. So a softening stroke or a pushing down and, and getting that modeling interest stroke. See the difference? in there like that and then I can do a softening stroke in over that if I want and just lose absolutely everything I did earlier so you got to be kind of careful there but it's kind of fun you know if you really want to practice which all of us should be practicing right you really want to practice put out some of these pear shapes and it's going to take practice start practicing how you're holding your brush and how you're moving your brush and uh, that's going to be very, very important as we go to seascapes and some of the other things, how we make waves. And that's why I'm always telling you guys, we need to do seascapes. We need, do you want to paint good roses? You know, a lot of you like the roses and stuff that I paint. You want to paint beautiful roses. You need to practice your brush movements. And that best way to practice that is to come from other styles, other things so that you see the brush and you see the colors and you see everything moving in different ways. You know, that's the best way. Let's do a nice shadowing stroke, shaping stroke right down here like that. Let's put a little half-tone, softened yellow oxide, half-tone right down that edge there. Push that in a bit. Let's do a softening stroke. Pitch wipe the brush, lay it real soft, and just pull it down. And I'll soften that out. Let's just get rid of that edge there. We can push through like that. I can tap through a little more interest right in there. I like some of that shadow. So I'll push and tap through just a bit. Wipe the brush. Let's just soften that through. Pull that through a bit. So sometimes I will use those softening strokes to push that in. 
and you'll see some of that difference. Let's go a little lighter, just a bit. A little more yellow oxide though in it. It's gonna make it a, a touch more opaque. But you see, that's getting really light for that back color back there. But you can see that is uh, a nice place to uh, push some of that light. It helps me with that roundness. Let's take a bit of the orange here. This is starting to tack up just a bit. Let's get a bit of that violet and orange. Push that onto the brush. Hold this right into here and just push that in just a bit here. Push some of those colors, those tones in there. Then we'll reset that light right up there again. I can do a softening stroke. I can put more of a slightly shadow tone to draw the edge of that pear a bit more there if I want. That was a little bit dark here. So we'll push that in. Do a little bit of manipulation of some of those tones out there like that. And, and I really like the paintings when I start to move faster because then I don't play in it quite as much. And I really, really want to just go with my finger on that. You know, sometimes because the finger, can I show you without you biting my head off that I swore I wouldn't touch it. See, something like this I'd use my thumb because that would help me get a little bit of a roundness to it. See that? Just that little bit of a movement sometimes to it. I like that. So I might like come into this area here and push like that and just round it just ever so much and just a little bit and that's what I love about it and you know for oils you can't you can't be touching that kind of stuff acrylics like this we can we can do that because they're non-toxic you don't have to worry about it but um, you know most auto primer they don't they don't touch too much there's a bunch of artists out there that do I don't want to say that there's a bunch of artists out there that do now there's a lot more green in that one than I have in that one but that's okay Let's uh, go back to the back one back there. Maybe we'll add some of that burnt sienna. Burnt sienna and green is a nice receding tone, you know, that works right in hand in hand with the yellows. You can cool it off with a tiny bit of your violet or your quinacridone or your, uh, um, your quinacridone or your red violet. So burnt sienna is nice. Let's leave that burnt sienna there and we'll model some yellow oxide right up in here into the front of it this one won't get as much you won't visually see as much movement and stuff into these tones because if you go put in a tremendous amount of movement into the tones you're going to bring it forward so you keep all of your tones softer more compressed and um, closer together and that will cause it to recede so back ones here, you want to just kind of paint the impression of them. Now, let's take a bit of our our burnt umber here. Let's even cool that little bit of green and a uh, little bit of the green and red violet. So I add the red violet to cool it, but that's a brighter color, so I add the green to gray it. And you see you get a nice cool. We can do a little bit of negative painting here, setting that tone in here and uh, we can use some nice receding edges and work your edges there to recede back let's uh, take some of that right up here underneath into the shadow right up here right up into this area here and you see as I make that darker cooler color that pear starts to come off a little bit more it starts to look like what's happening right in there with that one here. Let's keep that darker and cooler, grayer, right up in here. Sometimes it's easier to use a bigger brush, Dave, but you'll get the idea. That's what I want to do is I want to give you guys the idea of the painting here. And you would put your, uh, you know, as you talk about your shadows, you have your cast shadows. Your contact shadow is right up against the edge here, so this would be the contact shadow. And the contact shadow would be right up in here, which you see. But then the cast shadow comes further out. And the cast shadow will actually get a little lighter in value 
out through here. You can pull some of that out wherever your cast shadow is going to be. Here. Okay. Out like that. And of course, over here on this side of this pair here, since we added this one here, you would only have a contact shadow. You won't have a cast shadow because it's up too close. So, it, you know, you would probably take some of your medium beige and stuff and paint up real close, leaving just the dark for the contact shadow right up there in the very front of that. As you're working through, as you can see, you can kind of see how the pairs are, are coming together here, okay? As you uh, work through here, you know, let's just add, I always, I'm always a big advocate for getting your light into your foreground and stuff like that as well. Let's go with our yellows and our medium beige and our lights. Now, this is where I decided, because it starts to look, what happens is I'm all in really the warm side of the, of the uh, color wheel here, basically into my yellows. Even the burnt umber heads over there to that side. So, Tossing in some auxiliary tones, and this is one that, that's really great for that, is, and it will cool it down a bit, but it's some of your grays. Now see what the grays do. Now we can play the grays in a painting like this between the, the lights and the darks, but the grays will start to neutralize, and physically, you know, years ago I was a colorist, and I used to be um, part of the... Um, color marketing group and we set uh, colors for interiors interior designers and there was one interior designer always loved to read his thoughts on color his name was Malcolm Cooper and he always uh, said talked about mushy colors if you if you don't have any of those lighter grays and cool colors in there if you get too warm lights and darks and too warm the whole room starts to compress down and feels heavy and mushy and uh, I so true so you get this, you start to neutralize the color just a bit and and cool it just a bit and everything starts to change. See the difference between here and here. So everything starts to change. And so that's one thing I always start to look for. If I feel my paintings are starting to get a little heavy in color, a little heavy into the look, I start tossing in some lighter cool colors into the painting and that always works. And you know, I for, should have fed some some of the uh, medium into that. But let's just put a bit of the lights. See, that's where I like some of those lights to work up in here. And yeah, work that right up in here. Get some of that light direction in there. But you can see how that totally, totally starts to change the whole feeling of your pairs here. And you can you could actually go over towards accents. Let's take a little burnt sienna and a little blue and use that kind of like an accenting tone. See the blue come out right up through here like that. See the blue come out. And then you would probably want to, you know, later on maybe touch some of that blue and stuff into your pairs to carry some of that tone. But I could head just a bit more of that blue further off into... Uh, other areas. Let's smooth this off just a bit so you don't think I've lost my mind here. And pull through some of that there. But you can get the idea. I don't want to take a whole bunch of time here with this. But you can get the idea here. They're great ideas here for coloring and working and all of that kind of stuff. You can see how that totally changes the whole feeling. Let's go a little blue, a little burnt umber here into the very back cooler corner here of our painting back up through here now we'll leave some of those nice warm tones but let's just put some of that gray or blue kind of color back in there and that coolness totally changes the weight of the entire painting and uh, when I discovered that years and years ago I was just so excited. It's just like, wow. And then the hardest thing was remembering to do it. You know, when I was getting frustrated on something, remembering that it's probably a temperature thing, you know. And so I tossed those cool colors back into some of that, reduced some of that heaviness of the warmth, of those warm colors. And the painting starts to uh, 
come about just a little bit more, you know. And, uh, you, you know, you pick up just a little bit more stuff. So, you know, you don't see this into that photos there. And this is where I talk about this is what you should be doing. You should be making a painting, not copying a photo. Because a lot of times the photos are not good paintings, okay. So you put some of this back through here, soften some of this out through here. Let some light dark travel through some of that. You know, you're going to have, if you follow, if you follow good lighting, you'd have a through light here. A through light, just like you see me do on a lot of the florals and stuff. The light comes up and through, you would have a through light right here. So there's all kinds of stuff you need to study. Color theory to understand the light. What's going to happen with the light in your painting? You can maybe even put in a little more blue into that to really kick a nice painting that way. And, you know, clean up your edges and do all that kind of good artistic stuff here. Let's get it a little darker over here. But you see, just adding that cooler color in here, the whole weight of everything I'm painting, the mushiness of it, the heaviness of it is starting to disappear and the painting is becoming lighting, lighter. And this is going to allow me to really come in here now, take a little bit of my warm, my yellow oxide and my light, and really put in a nice light that would look pretty because the light that I put on will now be warm up against a slightly more neutral, cooler color and it will be prettier here. So I'll add just a touch of yellow oxide into that and start my light, push my light direction in, work that across, light, tap that through. I like the, the modeling of color. Boy, I sure do want to just go like that. <laughs> I'm really fighting that. Yep. Yep. So put a little bit of blue. Boom. See, isn't that kind of pretty? That little bit of blue in there. Just let some of that come out. Don't put it everywhere. Just let some of that come out into your grays, into some of this coloring. And that nice, warm, cool will work around our cast shadows there a bit. We'll have to redo the cast shadows and do all that stuff. But that's just kind of pretty. But this is what I also talk about, keeping it in perspective. See how adding these lights and these cools now at this part of the painting is changing everything about everything that we're doing, right? It's making everything a little different. And you'll be able to see some, maybe some of the problems in some of your pairs or something like that as you put some of this, you know, some of these colors on. And then you can come back and rework and you know, I will, a lot of times, I'll now that I have that, I'll come do a little bit of uh, clean up here on the edge of this pair, like the edge of this pair. I'll start to clean up and refine my edges here. Let's take a nice light yellow here and add some of that. Don't forget to feed that open medium. It'll bite you and dry on you if you if you forget too much here and uh, build that up a bit more Let's build that yellows up a bit more it's amazing I do love to get textures into them though and really make them pretty start to get those textures I feel that one kind of pulls down so that's where I start to find some of the shapes you know I start to look at the pear, you start to stare at it for a little bit and find some of the, you can kind of feel like the the motion of it, you know, feel the, like boom, like that boom, you know, just coming down here. Let's go a little bit orange, a little bit brown and orange. Reset that again. Go back into a little more yellow, but the center pear here, I'll paint many times. Now it all depends though, you know. It, um, you know, there's times where if, I mean, here I'm doing it a little bit detailed, but I wanted to show you a little bit detailed. If I'm doing a real fast all prima, man, I, I would just, you know, paint the tones and you do it a little differently, just real quick. But here we'll do an, a, a little bit softer job because some of my students really want to see a little more detail to it. That's what they 
told me in our online forums when I paint the pairs they want to see a little bit more so go ahead put the pressure on me to <laughs> do a better job but uh, yeah and you know it's like here I see just I mean that's just a beautiful little shape of a tone right in there that is uh, you know it's a half tone and it's giving that shape right there slightly greenish here let's put a little bit of that into our brush and let's come right into that area of the pear and let's just push that in see if we can give that look just a bit more to that area there and uh, we'll put a little bit of dark right up against that edge right there. See, I hold that flat. See, it does. it's not a blending stroke, but it just puts that tone in there. Now, do you soften something like that out or do you leave it? You know, that becomes part of your technique. You know, do you soften it or do you leave it? Do you put a little half tone? How much are you going to do? You know, are you going to leave a little more red here and there? That becomes part of your, you know, your technique. But you can see it, and I can work my edges here. I can refine my edges. Some of you might want to have super smooth edges to your pairs, especially up here in the front. Some of you might want to leave it a little bit more painterly. You know, you have fun little things here that, you know, put on the, the front of the pair here like that. And, you know, then you're going to have a little stem and stuff like that that you're going to drop into <laughs> That wasn't good. <laughs> that, boy, howdy, Dave. Can I have a do-over on that one? <laughs> that, that was a little too casual there. Yeah, boy, howdy. Well, let's just take some of that out. We'll, we'll use some of that removal medium and take some of that out there for just a minute. Wow. That was a little too quick. We'll just round that back up here. Start to make that look part of the pair here. A bit blur that edge a bit. Always say if it doesn't look like it fits into there, just blur it up a bit. Okay. So, and you can work that, and you know, and it's up to you how much to do. So you fit all your pairs in. This would be the technique that you would do, and you'd fit all your pairs in. Drop that one into uh, in position. Rework all of these again. Coming back through. What's going to happen as you're painting like this is it's going to dry down. And so you may find yourself coming back and lightening your pair three, four times as you're painting like this to get that as that's drying down. You can see I'm slowly getting up more and more and more to my, my Hansa here, putting that on. And especially that's going to happen. Now, why does that happen? It especially happens when you're working with, with semi-transparent pigments, not the opaque pigments. Not going to happen back there in the back, but it's going to happen um, in the uh, uh, front of that design with that semi-transparent because as it dries, some of that underpainting is going to show up and through. That's one reason why you, can, if you really want it glowy, you start with white. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's all different kinds of all different kinds of ways. But that'll give you a general idea how I would approach a painting like this. You know, and I start to draw my pairs, shape up my objects, put them all in, and uh, start getting the coloring and stuff like that up into there. You know, let's put a bit of this. And you don't need to see all of these. This gives you a good idea. I just wanted to give you an idea here to show you how you go about paintings like this. We'll get a little more casual, a little quicker. Here, so a lot of times I'll put on too much of a color like that. I do like painting out. I do that with roses, remember? I do that with roses and stuff all the time. I put on too much of a color and then I paint it back out what I don't need. I tend to do that on just about everything I paint. So we're going to work mostly back here with our yellow oxide. So that's going to set that color right into position here like that. Some of you are going, okay, Dave, what are you doing now? <laughs> You're screwing it up. No, it's just working the tones. As you work faster and stuff like this, as you let some of you get more casual with your brush and you come through with more of a correcting in just a minute. So you, you let more of that casual nature of the stroke start through. That's what happens when, why I love what happens with the, uh, the quicker paintings, you know. I'm going to gray some of this. Don't forget, you have beautiful gray tones with that green. 
That green and those colors really look nice. And see how that just pops that front. And that pear's just got a little bit too much of a bump onto it here. I'm going to round that off just a bit there. There we go. That's a little better. A little bit too much like a folk art pear and not enough like a... Nothing wrong with folk art pears. I painted those for 20 years. There we go. That fits it a little bit better. But that gives you an idea, okay? And I don't want to take up a whole bunch of time. I wanted to slow down, show you a little bit about this type of process. There's other tone, pure tone painting that you'll see with like the Retrievers and some of the others where I go in and make that specific tone, strike the tone, go in, make the next tone, strike the tone. But you have this time where I come in and I, I create movement like that. And you can see that movement into the pairs. And then you really see how it, sh it changes when you start adding some of those cool colors, okay? And then you can paint all your pairs like that and drop them all in. But that's basically the technique. As you move further back in the design, you get to, um, let's say, you do less. This is the main important. This is the queen of rose. This is the center of interest. You should probably use a little bit more light. It's getting really close but just a little bit more light probably in there, probably another time through. I, I like to work through the painting there again and then come back just maybe one more time through, setting up that, setting up that light. You can see it's getting a little better there, but that's how you do it, okay? So important things about holding your brush, okay? You got to remember with the long handle brush, this is one reason why if I'm going to do this particular technique, like I told you in the last video that I put up, guys, you know, here, right, where my palette is sitting on an eight table. It sits at about 25 degrees or so. And it's, a lot of my students paint on drafting tables, but I make what I call a table easel. It's just a board and it has a foot on it and it raises up and I like to paint down. But when I'm painting something like this and I'm going to use the long handle brushes, where I'm going to use the control that comes from the long handle brushes. I'm going to reach up about halfway here and set set the movement of the stroke. Then I'm going to go back onto the long handle, which lightens the tip, and I'm going to use the tip. This also allows me, though, to do a light, airy one from way back here on the brush, too. So I can do a light movement way back here. So the farther back you are on your brush, the lighter, the, the, the less, let me say, the less pressure the tip has, and so it t stays soft. So I stay back for a softening stroke. I rotate the brush from its flat up here to it this way, or to a, um, if I want to add the interest, make sure you pinch wipe your brush. Make sure you're not using water. Don't use water. Water is the solvent of this paint. If you touch that pair with water, you'll eat right through all the layers of that paint that we put on. And we don't want to do that in a wet and wet technique. You don't want to do it. Can you? Yeah, there's some that I'm going to show you. But it can, boy, it can get really frustrating if you start to do that with the water, okay? Water is a solvent. So when that, when I use that, I let my paints dry up and tack a little bit more than what it is here. Here, everything is wet, <laughs> okay? If I could hold this board at an angle, you could see everything is wet, okay? And uh, so I want to... I want to be careful what I do with that uh, with that wetness. I want to control that technique a little bit more with the uh, with how much uh, you know how much moisture I'm using, and I'm really really careful with the water because water is the pure solvent of the paint, and you'll you'll destroy the entire look of your painting by uh, getting water in there. You know, when you're working a wet on wet all the prima technique like this, you don't want to have that. So I'll just soften this out a little bit. But you get an idea here. You can have some fun. Go paint yourself a dozen pairs. You know, go go to your studio and practice this technique a thousand times, thousand pairs. It's going to take a little bit to learn how to hold the brush a little different. You know, as you get down into here, take some of these yellows. I mean, if you want to... Uh, there's just so much stuff I want to show you guys. But if you get, you know, I could have you here all day. 
you know. <laughs> but hey, Dave paints an eight-hour YouTube video, <laughs> you know. But you take some of this, if you're looking at the real artistic part of it, and you splash some of those colors out there, that's what some of the uh, Impressionist painters, 19th century Impressionist painters did. Look at that color harmony that comes through here. So you might even take, like, this real cool area right here and splash a little bit of that. Boy, I do want to touch that so bad. This, um, take a little extender here and just move through that just a touch here. But look at that other, see the warm and cool tones. Look at what that adds into your ground. There's, there's great, great things here. So as you get done, take some of those pear colors, work those into your grounds. You can enter, you know, if you introduce another color back here, like say I go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in here and spot the color just a, maybe a little bit more of a blue. And let's tone that blue down, maybe a touch of our, see the, the, the naphtha red light is close enough to an orange that it grays that blue down here. But let's just say, if you go in there and if you, and if you touch and spot a blue, which looks really pretty, you know, into the color, then, you know, sometimes we will touch and spot that blue right up in here onto the cool side of that pear, too. And it gives you that better that better harmony. I just love looking at that monitor. I've been looking at that. That looks pretty good on the monitors there, you know. Um, but make sure you get up, get back, look at it. Don't get up here like this and judge it all. Step back because as you're painting all the prima, how much difference you leave in those strokes gets into that thing we always talk about optical blending, okay? So we're going to we're going to do a lot this year guys and I'm going to take you a lot of different ways because the new acrylics like this can do a lot of really fun techniques, okay? A lot of really really fun te techniques and you just just don't use water with it, okay? But you can paint that and it's a lot of fun, okay? And uh, you know, come over those of you that aren't on our MeWe, we have a MeWe uh, group, heritage group. And we talk about the colors and the techniques. And I do, every day I do posting on there about color theory, about mixing, and, you know, what makes paints difference. I do, I show different techniques, I, and I challenge all of the, everyone over there. So that's our heritage artists and stuff over on MeWe. If you go over to the Jansen Art Studio, you hit the contact page, you'll see links to all of our social media, where we are everywhere across the social media networks. And we use media that... Uh, MeWe for our for our conversations just about what's all happening here inside our YouTubes and stuff like that and you can post fit, po, po, uh, photos and all that kind of stuff so go over there okay all right we'll do some more and I'll see you on the next one